All right, good afternoon. I um, kind of introduced myself a little bit further here. Um, I'm really excited to be with you guys. These lights are intense right now. I can hardly see you guys. Um, so I apologize if I'm looking and trying to, to gauge the temperature, make sure you can hear me and um, I'm making sense. I might be like squinting looking for you guys. So um, like Casey said, my name is Liz Ulanowski. Um, like the slide says, I uh, teach full time at Bellarmine University here in the physical therapy department um, locally, but I also uh, work as a physical therapist at um, Norton Brownsboro Crestman Rehab. Um, so I'm there a couple days a week. Um, I see a lot of new faces. I've been with Norton Healthcare now um, over 10 years. I've done lots of these events, so I'm excited to see some new faces, and um, hopefully you take something away from um, me today and the whole day. Um, when I was asked to give this talk, um, to think about prevention, exercise uh, with Parkinson's, I immediately can pull up a thousand slides that have all the evidence of what exercise does and how good it is and all the things we can do. And I've done so many talks in the past and um, big groups, small groups, um, individuals newly diagnosed with Parkinson's on why exercise is so good. And I promise I will hit on some of that today. I, I wanted to morph it a little bit in thinking about something I've learned a lot about over the past 15 years practicing, working with families, patients, students, um, techniques for myself, my coworkers, um, and I wanted to share that with you today. Um, the title, Mindfulness in Motion, Exercise and Alternative Techniques, um, when I first used this title, I um, thought of it as being mindful within movement. So you may have heard of Tai Chi, yoga, different walking meditations, things like that. As I was thinking about talking with you today, it, it kind of brought a new meeting um, to me and how we are mindful in the motion of our lives. So I'm a physical therapist, so I believe in movement but I'm a neurophysical therapist, so I believe even more about how we exercise our brain, brain health and function. Um, my neurospecialty has taken me in treating families and patients with spinal cord injury, stroke, um, brain injuries. Um, I have fallen in love with the community of neurodegenerative diseases, so such as Parkinson's. I do a lot also with Huntington's disease. Um, I feel really passionate and very humbled and grateful to be a part of people's lives and journeys living with um, a disease that changes things, right? Long term, short term, day to day. And what I hear from my families and patients I work with is you have to get up every day and kind of reassess. Things could be changing, you could be feeling good, you could be feeling bad, you could be feeling like, okay, yeah, I'm good today, or I'm not sure how I'm going to feel today. And so thinking about this idea of change and how we approach change is a topic that I also used in um, the last wellness retreat that Norton sponsored, and I'll get to that in a little bit, my involvement there, but it's really stuck with me in how we move and maneuver with change. So... As I go through today, just kind of that uh, big introduction there of the topic, um, the subtitle here of Building Resilience with Health and Well-Being Strategies is um, I'm going to give you some tips and things outside of just traditional exercise. So um, as my career and uh, my interface with you guys, the community, and how I interface with exercise, this is kind of an overlay of um, some important factors here. I'm a little quicker. I can't stand still when I'm talking. I'm just like, I can't. I got to look. I got to see. I got to move. Um, and I'm like that uh, when I teach with students also. All right, there's a couple concepts I wanted to start with today um, before we get to some of the meat of exercise and some techniques. Um, this word, this concept came um, 
really to my forefront about a year and a half ago. Um, I'm working on a project with a group of women um, <clears throat> on health and health and resilience in healthcare workers and how to avoid burnout. And so I've been thinking about this word a lot in contentment and, and really as the, as the end goal for all of us. Um, whether I'm talking to healthcare workers, families, my peers, my students, this idea of creating a sense of contentment in life, wherever we're at, is something we're all on the journey um, to do, right? And so take a moment to kind of read that. I always say to my students, when I put things on slides that seem so, yeah, duh, okay, like we can read this, we, we know some of these concepts, this, this idea of creating contentment is much harder to live out than it is to read on a slide. Um, I'm going to move to the next one here. Oops. The next concept of equanimity, this idea of mental calmness, composure, even in a difficult situation. I'm kind of giving you some language here to build up on why some of the things I'm going to talk to you about are so important. So equanimity in uh, maybe the simplest terms that I like to think about it is creating a strong back and an open front. We hear this a lot, if any of you practice meditation, this word's used a lot in different meditation circles or yoga practices. And I love this image for you guys living with the disease, a neurodegenerative disease, and family living with it also, how we have to have a strong back and an open front to move through the challenges, the joys, and all the things that you'll be um, facing with Parkinson's or right with life, because life doesn't stop either. So the idea of contentment and equanimity are concepts that we are constantly not trying to get to, but trying to create. Strong back, open front, calm to face difficult situations, and creating the sense of contentment. Well, yeah, Liz, okay, well, how do we do that? That seems, that seems reasonable. I don't, how many of you have seen this before? If you've heard me talk, it's probably in a lot of my presentations, but how many of you have seen the, the wellness wheel? Can you raise your hand? I can. I see a couple. Okay. Yeah. So I'll quickly describe what this is and the areas we're going to highlight. So as a physical therapist, I, like I said, believe in exercise. So the physical part of the wellness wheel is very important to me. It's my calling. It's my profession. It's what I'm really good at educating about. But there's all the other aspects to wellness and how to cultivate this sense of contentment and equanimity. There's social wellness family, friends, environmental wellness, our home, the spaces we spend a lot of time in, financial wellness, our savings, our, our money, how that looks, how we spend it, how we save it. Spiritual wellness can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Emotional wellness, how we take care of ourselves emotionally. Well, most of us have heard of emotional intelligence, how we cultivate understanding our reactions, reactions um, from others in different situations. Intellectual wellness, you all are here, so you're really cultivating that today with some of the speakers and, and gaining a deeper understanding with Parkinson's. But that can span into lots of other things, cognitive wellness, such as picking up a new skill or hobby. Physical wellness is taking physical care of our body. And this is a really important thing for families living with Parkinson's, not just the individual, but the family. Exercise has many, many benefits to how we feel, how we move, staying in our homes, preventing falls. And so we'll, we'll dive into the physical part um, here in a moment. 
the mindfulness piece, how we take care of ourselves emotionally, maybe some of this might hit a spiritual for some of you, a spiritual note for some of you, is something I'm going to challenge you to think about those things and how it over, overlaps with your physical wellness. So I mentioned taking care of your brain. Exercise takes care of our brain. All this stuff does by thinking about it, shifting our priorities. But we're going to go through a couple things, uh, specific strategies, I guess. This image um, came to me pretty recently, and I thought, I, I was like, I'm not really sure how it fits in this talk today, but I really like it. And so when thinking about the wellness wheel and how we uh, think about how we structure our lives, what I'm going to ask you to do at the end of my talk today is think about how your day is set up, what changes you might need to make to help promote um, a not necessarily happier, but a more intentional day in which you feel good about where your energy is going, time. And so this um, comes from a, a caregiving model. And I think about this with my student interactions, uh, my residents. How involved are we in a difficult situation, a person, someone else's life? And when we think about trying to avoid long-term burnout, um, and those of you, everybody in this room um, living with Parkinson's, you're, you're here for the journey, right? And so it's, 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 a, it's a long journey. So how do we interface with this journey in an intentional way so we don't avoid burnout for the person living with Parkinson's, but also the family, loved ones, or, or whoever that is surrounding us? So I, I like this image when we think about a skillful connection. You're in, but you're also out. You're taking care of yourself, but you're involved in the situation. Really, really strong boundaries can sometimes take us out of that and away from the situation and not connected. We definitely don't want that, but we also don't want to be swept away where we're so in the circle that we can't objectively see or take care of ourselves. And then you see the feet pointed away, burnout. This model, can you can kind of apply it to your situation. You can kind of think about it for yourself. For my students, my peers in the healthcare world, I'm trying to avoid this last thing, right? Burnout, long-term burnout. For you, I want the same thing. Living with Parkinson's, we're trying to avoid that long-term burnout of, gosh, I'm just so done talking about it, thinking about it, either living with Parkinson's or um, family surrounding. So however this may fit in your situation, it might be something to think about. This is overlaps in how we take care of our brain ourselves and how we how we interface with each other. Okay, so I promised you I'd talk about exercise. I will. Um, exercise with Parkinson's is by far one of the best modalities and things that you can do for yourself. Why? Well, Parkinson's disease changes the way that we move, right? Um, whether tremor, stiffness, postural instability or balance issues. So immediately, as physical therapists, we want to help with all of those things. We don't want to help on the back end. We want to help on the front end. So I am extremely fortunate to work for Norton Healthcare where this preventative model over the past 10 years has really been developed and cultivated and really bought into that physical therapists do not interface with you guys at the end or even the middle. We want to do it at the beginning. And so when we are working with somebody in which your body is changing, you might not know how it's changing. You might be confused if it's, am I aging or is this Parkinson's? What is it? 
physical therapists can help um, establish what those, what those changes are and what they mean. We know through lots and lots of research, and I always say when talking to groups like this, our community with Parkinson's, we're very lucky. We have a lot of money and people out there really interested in studying exercise, what types of exercise are beneficial, and with all that effort and all these years, we still don't know the exact thing to tell you to do. Why? Because you're all so, everybody's so different, right? Like every individual is different. Not only are you different in the way Parkinson's might be, but you're also different in your interests, in what you want to do, how much time you want to spend. And so that's the art of what physical therapists can do is we can interface with you, help you figure out what's the most important thing to focus on right now, but also what the heck do you like to do? And, and let's figure that out. I think he's in the audience today, um, but when I first came to this community and started doing community um, things, talks, exercise groups, um, Jay Miller told me, you know, Liz, it's just what people will do. That's the best exercise, what people will do. Oh, there you are, I see you. <laughs> um, and it always has stuck with me. And, I, and as, a, as a younger clinician, I wanted, to be, I wanted to be the person who told you the best evidence and, and what to do, and, and this is how much you should get on a treadmill, and this is how much you should do this. And sometimes it simply comes, what, what will people do? And how do we promote that? Our team of physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists within Norton Healthcare and the ones I work with at Crestman Rehab are so very skilled at helping navigate this with you guys and for you guys. The layer to that is um, they also really believe in this idea of mindfulness, which I'll, I'll expand on later. So the types of exercise that are out there that have been studied, that have been proven to be beneficial in one way or another um, for this community. Dancing with Parkinson's. Uh, we have many local groups, um, also um, one of them being at Bellarmine University, where our professor there and students dance. Dancing creates community, partnership, moving to a beat. So, Exercise doesn't have to be lifting weights. Actually, I'm very against that. I hate that myself. I would never give you 10 pounds and be like, let's do this. But dancing, music, taps into many parts of our brain. And so some people really like that. And some people are like, Liz, like, you're crazy. I, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not dancing. Lots of research in dancing, rhythmic movements. So not just dancing, but any kind of rhythm. There's also this idea of functional exercise. This is usually a new concept for people that I'm talking with. Um, with Parkinson's, I mentioned, right, the body's changing. Our goal as physical therapists is to help you understand your movement patterns because the part of your brain that's impacted is changing how it's telling you to move. So we try to bypass that system to make you aware of how you come out of a chair, how you walk, how you turn, how you get off the floor, things that are just changing and, and you don't recognize it until sometimes there's a moment when you can't get out of a chair. It's, hard, it's harder to get off the couch, right? So these movement patterns as they change, we want to interface with those early in kind of the umbrella of functional exercise, functional movement. So we do a lot of very task-specific training, do a lot of sit-to-stands, a lot of turning training, getting on and off the floor, lots of walking, walking backwards, walking backwards on a treadmill, walking sideways, walking with head turns, all the things that you need to do in your daily life that you don't think of, walking and carrying items up and down stairs. So we train those early and prominently because we are trying to keep those movement patterns, those functional movements, really, really sharp. Ultimate goal, keep you home, keep you safe, keep you with your family, whatever that ultimate goal is. 
So functional task-specific training, very, very prevalent in the literature as being very powerful part of all any exercise program. You may have heard of the word big, loud, power. So if you've been to physical therapy before, or speech therapy or occupational therapy, you've probably heard these words. Um, we're always like, be big, be loud, be powerful. The way that um, Parkinson's changes our body is it wants to make everything smaller. So lots of research has been put into what cues tell you to be big, upright, and it's big. The word big has been studied, not fast, but big. And so how do we tell your brain that we want this instead of this, that we want this instead of this? And so um, the cueing system is really important. So as physical therapists and with an exercise, we have this overlay of how to cue your brain to get output for movement, and movement we want to keep. We're very lucky, I mentioned this before, to have um, several different protocols, certifications out there. Our therapists um, at Crestman have them. If you're not, if you're from, um, not in the Louisville community, there's ways to find these therapists. But POWER, PWR certification, is um, one of them, as well as LSVT. So that's there on the left. Power is created um, to build to flows of movement. We call this kind of movement or exercise amplitude-based training. So amplitude means big and aware and understanding how your body's moving. In standing, sitting, kneeling, half kneeling, on your back, on your stomach. So in all these different functional positions. We have lots of different exercise modalities in the community here and elsewhere. We have boxing. Boxing right now is one of the most popular exercise modalities I think across the country. We have a really, really great local boxing program. Um, and if you're interested, I will introduce you to some people that can get you right connected to it. But boxing for Parkinson's um, is something that um, is really, really engaging. It taps into the community aspect of exercise, which um, is really, really important. A lot of research has been done to help us as physical therapists understand how to keep people motivated throughout this journey with Parkinson's. And one of the number one things is community exercise. So it doesn't have to be boxing. It could be dancing. It could be yoga. It could be drumming. So there's lots of different um, ways that Norton Healthcare um, supports this idea of community fitness and exercise. Cycling was really, really popular when I first came to this community, biking. Decent amount of research um, there um, as a fitness exercise, but also helps with rigidity, stiffness. There's a lot of resources out there for you that you can join exercise classes virtually. So the last picture there, the Parkinson's Foundation, they do have a lot of, of resources and virtual classes um, as well. So when we think about the exercise package with Parkinson's, there's, there's different umbrellas. There's aerobic. We think about that as running, walking fast, anything that gets our heart rate up, cycling. We think of function doing actual functional tasks that you want to maintain, keep doing. We think of balance. Balance can be trained and pushed in lots of different ways. We can do that through things like yoga or really specific balance exercises. 
So there's some exercises that push balance more than others. We do know that falls are really prevalent in this community, so that's a big umbrella. And oftentimes physical therapists do help push this aspect because this is a more scary aspect to do at home by yourself and really push yourself. The last umbrella, well, not the last, there's a couple other ones, flexibility, a flexibility program, strength. So when we think about uh, strengthening, like I mentioned before, lifting weights, machines that you see at your gyms, those actually are pretty ineffective. Um, we, we've seen through studies just lifting weights doesn't transfer to the outcomes we want to keep um, us functional. It's really, really good for endurance, muscle tone, and stiffness. But there's other ways to strengthen, maybe within our functional tasks and things like that. The last part of exercise, um, and I don't, I don't always know what to call this when I'm talking with people, but it is the idea of mindfulness. This is the working towards calming and controlling emotions, our brain, our, I call it biceps for our brain. So a lot of folks, I will tell, part of your exercise um, plan is to sit quietly. Lay on the floor, lay on the bed. Whether you want a meditation app or do it, you know, without a guided, this should be part of part of the exercise. So, we're going to practice a little. So there's a couple, if, if you're familiar with meditation at all, and sometimes I'm um, leery to use those words, it, it's an intimidating thing. It was intimidating for me to start talking about it, start doing it, how we think about it. So I, I do like the structure or the language of just being mindful of what's going on versus strict meditation. When you say meditation, you think of like this person sitting like this on a pillow on the floor or like you have to have like candles and like things around you. Um, that Well, that's not how I meditate. And even more so, we're finding out that it, it just, it doesn't have to be just this structure. Um, so we're going we're gonna to go through um, a few things here. So there's meditation, there's guided meditation, there's solo meditation. I'm not going to go through the different types of meditation that there is out there. I'm going to lead you through a couple things here, but there are lots of different types if you're interested. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is something called motor imagery. So it's a type of awareness that, that brings your attention to your movement. So I use these strategies, if anybody experiences anything uh, like freezing or having some difficulty initiating the step, stutter stepping, feet stuck in the mud, those are kind of some of the things that I hear. I use motor imagery a lot to help prepare your brain for movement. What happens in freezing is that we're confused. Our brain's telling us to do something. Our, our feet can't quite figure out that step, which step should go first, the weight shift that's happening. And I use this concept of pausing, either bringing your attention to one foot or the other. And sometimes we may even have to pause and imagine ourselves moving through the doorway, into the bathroom, or wherever it is that, that maybe is a tricky spot in your house. So I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of combine both of these things, a meditation and a motor imagery um, exercise for us today. So just so you can kind of feel it and kind of maybe have an understanding of what I'm talking about. So if you're comfortable with it, it's after lunch, so I hope that you don't fall asleep in your chair, um, but I would like you to close your eyes. So our visual system provides a lot of input to our brain. And so when we're practicing these things of being mindful in the moment or motor imagery, it, it's important to take away some sensations, some input, if you can. 
If that's not comfortable to you, pick a spot in front of you and allow your eyes to just gaze there. I'd like you to take a moment to feel your feet on the ground. You've learned a lot, had a lot going on today. You may feel a little overwhelmed with information you've received. You may feel energized. Try to let any of that go and just think of your feet on the floor. You're here right now. I'd like you to now take three deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. With each breath, allow your shoulders, your jaw, your back to relax. Breathe in and breathe out. By bringing our attention to our breath, we can calm our nervous system, our thoughts, our emotions. Breathe in and breathe out. Now I'd like you to take your brain to thinking about walking in here today. Some of us, it's very easy to conjure up an image of us walking. Some of us don't think in these images. So whatever's right for you, I want you to either feel or see yourself walking in here. How did it feel? How did you look like? Were you rushed? Were you nervous? Now, I want you to practice thinking about walking in here confident, strong, powerful, and with ease. Think about walking in this room, pulling the chair out, and sitting down. Allow your brain to practice that over and over in exactly the way you would want to do it. Not how you did it, but how you'd want to do it. Now, I'll have you bring your attention back to your breath. Take one more deep breath that pushes your belly out and gets your diaphragm engaged, and then open your eyes. Okay. So I kind of mixed a few things, some breathing techniques, some meditation, how we breathe and focus on a certain part of our body, and then also that motor imagery. So I'm going to get this story totally wrong. So nobody can like cite me or look this up and then say, you said this wrong. But I know the general idea. Um, so I want to share it with you because this idea of motor imagery is not new. It's maybe newer um, in the world of how we interface with uh, neurodegenerative diseases or neurologic diseases such as stroke. Motor imagery, we, they do it a lot in sports. So Michael Phelps, ever since he was a sm like child, his dad and his trainer, part of his practice was going through it in his head over and over and over again, practicing it in his mind. And I don't remember which Olympics it was, if it was the trials or the actual Olympics. This is the part I, I, my brain doesn't like to hold on to those details but his goggles filled with water, right? And so he didn't freak out, he kept going. 
He knew his body knew what to do. He knew to go to his backup plan to count his strokes. And he ended up setting a personal best, a world record with his goggles filled with water. And so it's just an example of that layering of the power of the brain and harnessing that motor imagery. I don't think any of us will be at that level, but you know. All right, um, I, to be mindful of time, the next few slides I'm gonna go through really quickly to give you a kind of just a continued layer of, of what I'm kind of talking about and putting it all together. Meditation, mindfulness within movement. We are trying to harness this idea of being within a window of tolerance where we're not really heightened in situations, whether it be with movement or other things. We don't want to be shut down or hyper aroused, and we know that sometimes medications can affect that, certainly. But meditation, mindfulness, motor imagery, all of these things um, help cultivate that. The kind of last, I guess, didactic uh, thing that I want to share with you is this mindfulness meditation, moving with mindfulness, and cultivating a sense of contentment. How we do that is cultivating this idea of self-compassion, living with Parkinson's or uh, family. Part of, oops, part of cultivating self-compassion uh, Kristen Neff is the leading researcher um, in this area, has broken it down into mindfulness, common humanity, and self-kindness, in which we don't have time to dive into all those things today. But mindfulness is one of the number one things that we have to do to care for ourselves in order to care for others. Self-compassion, interface with mindfulness can look very different for all of us. So I have some examples up here, you know, the group exercise we've talked about. Um, there's lots of other ways that we cultivate this care for ourselves and mindfulness, massage, meditation, exercise, and movement. So I mentioned this early is what I hope you will walk away with today is having a, a deeper understanding of this idea of building resilience through mindfulness. Could be through meditation or, or different things. You may have simply taken away the wellness wheel. If you've never seen that before, that might be a concept that you wanna revisit, think about further. You may have learned my gosh, like physical therapists do a little more than I thought. Maybe I should go see one. So maybe if that's all you took out of, great. Um, but I, I put this um, phrase up here, setting up your day, because as I started earlier talking about how Parkinson's each day can feel different, be different, I really encourage a lot of my folks to approach each day differently and not have this expectation that I'm going to feel the exact way that I felt yesterday or it's going to be the exact same or I can do the exact same thing. Now, this is hard when you're trying to plan things with family, grandkids, all this life stuff, but acknowledging that you may have to shift or pivot, right, or add to your day if you're feeling really good. So I hope that when you leave here, this idea of mindfulness, maybe meditation, maybe layering it into your movement. We can do walking meditations, walking mindfulness. How you might add it into your day. All right. So the, the last thing I have here before a couple questions is, um, I guess, a little shameless plug. Um, Norton Healthcare. Um, sponsors uh, wellness uh, retreat. Um, they have been so gracious through the years. I had this like crazy idea um, and they've let me keep expanding it each year. Um, our next fall wellness retreat, um, I also call it a workshop, is um, in a couple weeks. 
October, gosh, I can have it, 21st and 22nd. So these events um, are really, really, really great community builders in which um, Natalie Vance, who's another physical therapist and yoga instructor, and I take a part of that wellness wheel and we expand on it. We talk about it. We exercise together. We drum together. We do stuff with scar. We do stuff with scarves together. We talk. We eat. All the fun things in life. This time or this retreat, I am. We've done this theme before, but I am incredibly excited about it. We're gonna kind of go back to just fun, and remember that part of our wellness and our well-being and mindfulness is sometimes just having fun together, and not talking about all the heavy stuff, right? Sometimes we need to do that, and sometimes we need to have fun. So we have a comedian coming. We have um, different exercises that will promote joy. We, and laughter and happiness, we have activities like games, competitive games, like ring toss, cornhole, parachute things. So it's going to be just fun. So um, if you're interested in that, um, there it is. I'm sure there's flyers, too, but you can let me know. There's my contact information. So um, if we have any questions, I have a couple minutes.